go ahead and open up your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. We're going to be in verses 25 through 40 uh, tonight, finishing out chapter 7, just the easiest set of sermons I've ever preached, definitely. Uh, if you weren't here the last couple ones, there's some challenging things. 1 Corinthians is keeping us on our toes. But this is sort of uh, almost like a, the end of a three-part series, chapter 7 being kind of its own little series. And uh, two weeks ago, preaching a lot on uh, marriage, uh, last week, preaching a lot on uh, what does it look like to be content in the place that God has called you, and this week specifically focusing on what does it look like if you are single in the church of God. So the title is The Wisdom of Singleness in a Married World. Now, I contemplated a different title because in America now, less than 50% of adults are married. Uh, the divorce rate uh, is down but only because marriage is down. So the rate actually isn't down, but the numbers are actually down, right? Um, because marriage has kind of fallen out of favor, right? Mar marriage is no longer the, the norm. More kids are born to unmarried parents than married parents. And so I guess maybe we could go a different direction to th than this if we wanted to. But I do think this is important for us, both, both in the culture of our church and the church in America uh, in a larger sense, but also because in our church, so just in our membership, we're 50-50, 50% married, 50% single, which is, is quite high, actually, uh, for a lot of churches. Uh, I don't know if that's because one of our pastors is single, uh, that maybe people are like, well, if it's okay for him, it's okay for me. I'm not really sure uh, why. Uh, and, you, and as you'll see, that is not a dig at singleness. Well, one of the things we want to see in this passage is that singleness is not a problem to be endured, but a gift to celebrate. So there's, there's an argument to be made, um, you know, for a lot of reasons why we should study this. Why does singleness and why should we focus on that? Well, number one, everyone experiences singleness. I don't know of any of you, but as far as I know, no one's born married, okay? All of us will be single at one point, and uh, depending, unless you have impeccable timing and, or the Lord returns, even our married couples, one of you is going to be single again at some point. Uh, and, and some people can be begrudgingly single, you know, the people who wish they weren't single. I'm not going to point at anyone because I don't know anyone particularly, but being single but not being content in it is not the same thing as following God's call into singleness. You can actually idolize marriage without being married. If all you do is wish that you were married, then you certainly aren't content in your singleness. You can also be single because you're rebelling against marriage. That's not the same thing as embracing your call to follow God into the state of singleness. But unfortunately, I think in a lot of churches, it's at least been my experience, and I sort of witness it some. I think you see it in even, uh, even the way kind of like culture works, is we sort of see marriage as like the path that everyone should take. And so if you're single, it's like, well, we, we pity you a little bit. You know, it's like varsity and JV Christian. Um, and so we, we take all the singles and we put them in a class not for the hopes of discipling them in their faith, but maybe we can get a few of them to connect, right? We, we sort of think that this is a problem that we have to solve, and Paul has a totally different view on singleness. You know, Paul has been in 1 Corinthians 7 dealing with particular challenges in this church in Corinth relating to marriage and singleness and the call that God has on that church. He reminded us uh, at the beginning of 1 Corinthians 7, that marriage is a good gift and sex is a part of that good gift inside of marriage. Uh, last week in the middle part of 1 Corinthians 7, we saw how God has called each of us to different assignments, some to marriage, some to singleness, and whatever assignment God has given you is good and you should be content in that place. And, and I definitely don't think you can accuse your pastors of skipping hard topics when we preach on sex, circumcision, and slavery, which is what I did last week. And so um, definitely not skipping the hard stuff here. Uh, that might have been a little bit too pr provocative of a title, if you ask me. So in this week, we're going to conclude chapter 7, and we're going to look at Paul's advice. But remember, it's continued from his previous advice on uh, marriage and sex in marriage and contentment. And he's, he's really going to kind of turn and focus specifically on those who are single and why that calling from God is an opportunity to serve him. So if you're not single, you might be like, okay, I can just sort of nap this one out. But like I said, you might be single again at some point. And the principle that he is teaching us is for all of us. 
right? What does it look like to steward our gifts and our assignment regardless of where we find ourselves? And if you are a member of this church and you are married, that means half of your brothers and sisters in Christ are single and you are called to serve and encourage and minister to them during this season, whether it's temporary or for the duration of their life on this earth. So while it might be a particular encouragement to our single folks, it is a reminder to us all that singleness isn't necessarily settling. It has dignity and value and purpose in the mission and call of God. And so if you sort of took the last three weeks in order, I would say they kind of build to this crescendo. Uh, Week one would be, what does it look like to recognize my call? Week two would be, what does it look like to accept my call? And this week would be, what does it look like to then leverage that call for the mission of God? So what does it look like uh, to hear and understand that God has put me, where God has put me in singleness or marriage, then to accept and find contentment and joy in that, and then to leverage that for the mission of God. So here's what it says. Hear the word of the Lord out of 1 Corinthians 7, starting at verse 25. Now concerning the betrothed, I have no command from the Lord, but I give my judgment as one who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. I think that in view of the present distress, it is good for a person to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be free. Are you free from a wife? Do not seek a wife. But if you do marry, you have not sinned, and if a betrothed woman marries, she has not sinned. Yet those who marry will have worldly troubles, and I would spare you that. This is what I mean, brothers. The appointed time has grown very short. From now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no goods, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For the present form of this world is passing away. I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord, but the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife, and his interests are divided. And the unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit, but the married woman is anxious about worldly things, how to please her husband. I say this for your own benefit, not to lay any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. If anyone thinks that he is not behaving properly toward his betrothed, if his passions are strong and it has to be, let him do as he wishes. Let them marry. It is no sin. But whoever is firmly established in his heart, being under no necessity but having his desire under control, and has determined this in his heart to keep her as his betrothed, he will do well. So then he who marries his betrothed does well, and he who refrains from marriage will do even better. A wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives, but if her husband dies, she is free to be married to whom she wishes only in the Lord. Yet in my judgment, she is happier if she remains as she is, and I think that I too have the Spirit of God. Makes perfect sense. We can go home. That was easy enough. I'm glad you all understood it. Let's move on. Let's start at the beginning uh, in verses 25 to 28. Uh, This is Paul's reminder again of what he's already said, to remain Right, he starts off and he says, now concerning the betrothed. Now, I think this is maybe a little bit of a confusing translation. The word there for betrothed is the word for virgin. So if you see betrothed in this passage, you can just substitute it for virgin. It's also archaic and a little odd. I think it's right that the translators chose betrothed because that's what he's talking about. That would have been the way people talked at that time. And it certainly sounds a little weird if you were to substitute virgin in our modern vernacular for some of these uh, words betrothed. But he's talking about you know, these, these people in the church who are engaged to be married, what do you do? Should you get married or should you not get married? Uh, Paul says, are you bound to a wife? Don't seek to be free. Are you free from a wife? Do not seek a wife. He's saying, look, be where you are, what God has called you to. So if you marry, it's not a sin. Now, he does have this phrase, which we saw earlier. He says, I have no command from the Lord. Now, some people hear that and they think, well, that's just, this is just Paul's opinion. We can sort of put this as like off to the side. That's not what Paul's saying. We talked about this earlier. When he says, I have no command from the Lord, he's saying this has not been dealt with elsewhere in Scripture. This is new teaching, which makes perfect sense because when this was dealt with prior in Scripture, uh, people had not converted to Christianity. He's dealing with a new, new situation of people who might be engaged or married who come to Christ. Well, what do you do in that situation? 
What about if the wife comes to Christ and the husband does not? We already talked about this previously uh, in uh, a few weeks ago. Don't, don't ever pit Paul against Jesus. It's one of the tricks that people like to use to get around the commands of God. Remember, Paul himself is an authorized apostle from Jesus, recognized by the other apostles who were with Jesus, understood as uh, giving us inspired scripture. The early church recognized that. The other apostles recognized this. This wisdom from Paul is from the Spirit of God, so we need to listen to it. And he says this, in view of this present distress, it is good for a person to remain as he is. What is this present distress? Paul, Paul recognizes that we are living in the last days. Now, some people have said Paul got this wrong. He thought Jesus was going to come back in his lifetime. That's a debate for another time. We know this. We have been living in the last days since Jesus rose from the grave. We understand that every day we are alive is one day closer to the coming of Christ. Paul is trying to make a decision that is clear-headed in view of the kingdom of God and the return of Jesus. The word distress here could also be translated as, as urgent. Right? He, he's, he's making a decision based on what is most important, what is most significant. And for Paul, he says, maybe, he says it a little more directly, but I'm saying maybe you should consider your calling not in light of your personal preference, but in light of the return of Jesus Christ. He's not demeaning marriage. Paul doesn't demean marriage. Read Ephesians 5, also written by Paul. And you'll find out that he is not saying marriage is, is this lesser thing. It is a picture of the gospel. What he's, what he's doing is he's asking you to evaluate your priorities in light of the urgency of the gospel. What would it look like to evaluate your life choices in light of the urgency of the gospel? I think about the second time that I went to West Africa, uh, went to a village on the border of another country uh, in, the, in the country we were at. I went to visit a missionary there for the first time. I, I think of this missionary often, her picture is on my refrigerator or, or was for a while, been there for 20, 30 years, ministering to small villages, tribes. When we were there, we went to this one tribe. Uh, that these other missionaries had been working to translate the Bible into their language for 13 years. They translated uh, Genesis, Matthew, John. When we got there, uh, 1 Corinthians, apparently they had some stuff to deal with. When we got there, we got to listen to them read the book of James for the first time ever in their heart language. And I think of this missionary all the time, a single woman who had given up the American dream of a comfortable life here in the States, she lived a difficult life. She had to have at least half a tank of gas in her, uh, in her car at all times in case she had to flee across the border. There had been multiple coups and civil wars in this country. But she did that because her mind was fixed not on her temporary comfort, but on the kingdom of God. Now, Paul says it in a, maybe a way that I wouldn't be brave enough to say. He says, yet those who marry will have worldly troubles, and I would spare you that. Husbands, you don't need to say amen at this point. All the wives are looking around to see who got excited about that. Right? I, don't, I don't know if I would describe my wife this way. This is how you can kind of tell that Paul is uh, single when he describes you know, uh, marriage as being bound to your wife. He's like saying a ball and chain, which I would not go around saying. But he's making a point, right? He's saying, if you're married, you have other responsibilities. It's a fact. Godly, God-given responsibilities. As a husband and a father of four, there are things that I am obligated to do to honor the Lord that a single person is not obligated to do. He's saying, I want you to think about that. Before you obligate yourself to this other calling. I want you to think about it in light of kingdom priorities, verses 29 through 31. This is what I mean, brothers. 
The appointed time has grown very short. From now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, those who buy as though they had no goods, those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it, for the present form of this world is passing away. It's always helpful when, so, when Paul says, this is what I mean. Then he goes on to say something, I'm not exactly sure what he means. So I don't know, maybe he's a good preacher like that. Um, he's, he's clarifying what he's said He's talking about this time, this appointed time, the plan of God that is coming to fruition, that the present world is passing away. The new reality of God's kingdom has broken in. The heavenly reality has peaked through the veil of the earthly one. Here's what he says in Romans 13, verses 11 and 12. Besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone, the day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. However long this present world will last, it is passing away. And you and I are one day closer to heaven every day that we're here. And so we should live in light of the quickly approaching return of Jesus. It should change our priorities. Jesus puts it this way in Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is... There your heart will be also. The problem is we flipped the order of our loves. We love the temporary over the eternal. We seek the earthly over the heavenly. We put our hearts into things that are passing away. We're busy rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic. See, the paradox of the gospel is that the more you treasure heaven, the more joyful your life on earth will be. The more, the way it looks like is this. The more you love Jesus, the more you're going to love your spouse. The more you treasure heaven, the more you're going to be satisfied in your singleness. The problem is we try to go the other way. We think, well, if I just get a spouse, then I can live for Jesus. Or if I, if I can just uh, have what I want on this world, then I can give Jesus the leftovers. Paul says, you are mistaken and if you're not careful, you're going to anchor your life in the world that's passing away. In some sense, the eternal reality makes us look and live as if our current realities aren't even real. That's what it looks like when you live for heaven. That's the point he's kind of making with this hyperbole. He's saying, when you live as if, you, as if heaven is more real than earth, it's going to make your earthly life Look silly to the world around you. You're going to do things differently. You're going to live differently. Now, he's clearly not saying, you know, that, that you shouldn't, you know, that you should abandon your wife or something like that. We've read the rest of 1 Corinthians 7. We've read the rest of what Paul has said uh, in Ephesians and elsewhere. There, there's this tension here, right? Now, now, whenever we get to tension in Scripture, the easiest thing to do is sort of like... Um, Ignore one of them and embrace the ones. You're like, you, you, some people could read this chapter and be like, everyone should be single, right? Paul said it. It's better to be single. If you're not single, you're not that holy. Uh, the holier people are single, right? This is sort of the view of, of certain Christian groups through the years, that celibacy means you're more holy. And then you have other groups that sort of say, you know, marriage is the, is the most important thing. And if you're not married, then you're not uh, living in God's will. There's a tension here. And healthy theology holds these tensions and requires wise application. We've already seen in this very chapter that a healthy church should be full of those who are called to singleness and those who are called to marriage, and both are good. One does not have to be bad for the other one to be good. What matters is that you are pursuing the one that God has called you to, not the one that you prefer not the one that everyone pressures you into, the one that God has called you to. There's this tension here between this earthly living and this heavenly reality. Right? I've heard someone say once before that, that some people are so heavenly minded they're of no earthly good. I think there's some truth to that. But if I had to guess, most of us are so earthly minded we're of no heavenly good. 
Right? We hold these things in tension. We hold in tension this truth that God says it's not good for you to be alone, and yet it is good, if not better, for you to be single, which makes me think that God has more than one way to cure our loneliness. That marriage has earthly trouble, yet marriage is a gospel picture of God's ultimate love for his church. These things can be can coexist in the church in a beautiful, vibrant display of God's grace in our lives. See, Paul's not saying that the world is bad and we should avoid the beauty and gifts of God's creation, but he is saying that even the best things in this life are second best. Even your marriage, which you should esteem greatly, is a picture of an ultimate reality of God. And so before we put all of our treasure in earthly things, let's make sure we're fully invested in the most important things. That even in the ups and downs of life, that there is a day coming when God will wipe away all of our tears. That the heavenly reality is more real to us than this passing earthly one. So remaining single might be the best use of your life. Consider your present situation might be exactly where God wants you. That God wants to change you more than he wants to change your circumstance. That the urgency of his kingdom is more important than the urgency of your personal comfort. I wonder if you and I only obey God with the leftovers of our life. I wonder if you and I only obey God if he works in a way that fits into our plan. I wonder if we only obey God after we get what we want? Or do we think according to kingdom priorities? And then we see the specifics of Paul's challenge in verses 32 through 34. We see the challenge of marriage and the opportunity of singleness. Verse 32, I want you to be free from anxiety. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the, of the Lord, how to please the Lord, but the married man is anxious about the worldly things, how to please his wife. And his interests are divided. And the unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord and how to be holy in body and spirit. But the married woman is anxious about worldly things, how to please her husband. See, Paul is, is refocusing them on the practical challenges of serving the Lord. If you are married, you have good and important God-given responsibilities. You have someone else. If you have kids, you have those kids to care for as well. You have these people to look out for, to provide for. Marriage gives you important, biblical, godly obligations, but they are obligations. You can't just worry about yourself. Your time has to be uh, given to other people. Your interests are importantly given to those that God has put in your house, which I think is one of the reasons why I think it's important that before you get married, you do it on purpose. Right? Our, our, our culture talks about love this way. You fall in love. Falling is an accident. The Bible says we walk in love. Walking is a choice. Before you get married, you need to do it knowing that God has called you to it and you rely on his grace to accomplish it. But there's just simply things that I cannot do because of my family responsibilities. There are times that if you need me, I will be rocking a child and I can't help you. There are times that I will be with my wife and I can't help you. There are things I cannot do as easily as some of our single members can do. And I love seeing it. I've witnessed it with my own eyes. People in our church that are single, that are devoting their time for the Lord, that are giving away uh, their free time, not filling it up with their own responsibilities and hobbies, but giving it away for God. I think of like a silly example of just what you can do when you're single. When I was first starting seminary, I was engaged. Uh, Whitney was finishing her last year of undergrad, so I was in my first year of grad school. And so I was living in this like seminary housing with two other single roommates. And you can devote a lot of time to studying when that's all you have to do. And so if you walked into my room, it was my first semester taking Greek, and I had all my Greek paradigms on the walls like a, like a um, conspiracy wall, you know, with like, like red lines to them, and I'm like walking around saying them. Like it was not a conducive environment 
for a wife to be in. But for a single person, you can devote a lot of time, right? That's just a silly example, but there's things you can do when you are single that God could call you to. You have the opportunity to focus on the things of the Lord in a unique and important way. There's a freedom, there's a flexibility you have to serve God. But unfortunately, our society thinks of singleness, I think, primarily as freedom to serve yourself. People think of, well, I don't want to get married because I have all these things to accomplish on my bucket list. I need to fill my time as a single person with these things that I want to do. The the decision of singleness is not how can I give it all to the Lord, it's how can I use it all for myself. And so I think sometimes I'll hear these messages in church for single people, and it is necessary to say, because the church kind of elevates family ministry so much, I think, that the, the, the pastor feels like he has to say, but you're important too, single people. You are. Every one of you is. But I don't want to stop there. You're important because God has a calling for your life to be used for his kingdom, not just to do what you want to do. See, the beauty of the gospel is that Christ gave his life so we could live. And the calling of the gospel is to give your life so others can live. So the question isn't, can I be happy in my singleness because I do what I want? It's, can I invest my singleness in the kingdom of God? It's, this isn't meant to just be a therapeutic moment for you to feel good when you're alone on Valentine's Day. It's a call to action. Your singleness will be wasted if you don't leverage it for God. And so if you look back on your single, single years and you're able to say, I did all the hobbies I wanted, I traveled all the places I wanted, I saved all the money I wanted, I got all the job promotions I wanted, I had all the friendships I wanted, but you cannot say, I lived with undivided focus and attention on God and the things of God, then you are missing an opportunity. And so the last point that I sort of just threw in there in this sort of grab bag at the end of the chapter is this. I want you to take this advice seriously. I think a lot of us hear this and we're like, okay, Paul, you're, you're, you're being too serious again. That's not really for me. You know, the American dream says I do what I want in my single years and I get married and I build this family and it's all about how I can build what I want. I want you to take Paul's advice seriously. Paul says this, look, I'm saying this for your own benefit, verse 35. He's not trying to, he says, I'm not trying to lay any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. He's not trying to put a tight rein, that's what it literally means, like a horse pulling back the reins. He's not trying to, to, to slow your roll. He's not, he's not trying to harsh your vibe, right? He's trying to free you to find joy in serving God, that singleness is not a curse, it's a blessing. Singleness is not an obligation, but it's an invitation to know and serve God. We use this language here when we talk about spiritual disciplines because I think it's important. I grew up thinking that if you did certain things, you were more holy, right? We, we, um, you know, if you gave money in the offering plate, that's like plus one for the week. You shared the gospel, it's like plus 10, Right? You just have this view of like, if I do more, I am better, I am more holy. So if you read your Bible, I'm a better person. It's kind of the feeling that I had. The problem is that's not true because nothing I do makes God love me more. Nothing I do makes God love me less. All of these activities, good and important things that God calls us to do, are invitations to walk with him and know him and serve him. So reading your Bible doesn't make you a better person, but it invites you to know God who transforms your heart. Sharing your faith doesn't make you a better person, but it allows you to participate in the joy of sharing the good news of the gospel that God has called you to do. If you're single and God has called you to singleness, this is not an obligation so that you can be a better Christian. It's an invitation to invest at least this season of your life in the things of God in a particularly undivided way. Right? Marriage is still good. Paul says it's not a sin to marry. Some of you need to marry. If your passions are strong and you, and you, uh, and you can't with, with restrain yourself, you need to marry. It's no sin. 
But not every one of us is called to marriage. And that's okay, and that's good. Whatever God calls us to is good. You know, marriage matters. We see that here. He talks about if you're, a wife is bound to her husband uh, as long as they live, right? Uh, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Genesis 2, Matthew 19, Jesus says this. But if her husband dies, she's free to marry another believer, only in the Lord. That's what it says. Marriage is still good. But Paul says in verse 40, yet in my judgment, she is happier if she remains as she is. And I think that I too have the spirit of God. I love that little phrase, Paul being humble as he does. He's really kind of subtly calling out the Corinthians. The Corinthians think that they're the spiritual, they're the most spiritually mature, that they have the spirit of God, that they have the spiritual gifts. And Paul's saying, look, I got the spirit of God too. Maybe before you think so highly of yourself, listen to what I'm saying. Maybe you take seriously what I'm saying about the call of God in your life. Here's my conviction deep down in my soul that the best place to be is where God has called you to be. That anywhere you go outside of the will of God is the wrong place to be. And you can have all the money, you can have all the relationships, you can have all the things, all the success, all the acclaim. If you are outside of the will of God, you will be miserable. I believe it. But in the will of God, no matter the suffering you endure, no matter the difficulty you have to walk through, that if you are in the will of God, you can experience true joy that cannot be touched by this world. So I wonder if you and I have taken Paul's call seriously or if we are just being discipled more by the patterns and things of this world than we are being discipled by the call of Christ. If the, the American dream, if the cultural current is, mo is more pressing on us to behave a certain way than Scripture, if we even consult the Word of God and the people of God before we decide what we are going to do or do we just do the next thing like we're expected to do. I, I, I've seen this my entire life. Right, there's, there's this sort of narrative that people in your life will give you about what the next thing, there's this sort of narrative that our culture has built. And so when I was growing up, I sort of um, look back on it and I think, honestly, I was just kind of going along with the flow. Right? For me, it was like, go to school, get good grades, um, you know, go to church, go to college, get a job, get a family, be happy. And it wasn't until late in high school I realized that maybe, what is God calling me to do? That I was, I was doing everything just going with the flow, just on accident. What would it look like instead of living my life on accident if I lived it on purpose for the things of God? See, the challenge of this passage is I can't look at each of you and be like, you should be married, you should be single, you should be married, you should be single. Because God has a plan for you, and my gift is not to tell you that necessarily. But all of us are called to go where God has called us to go, to do what he's called us to do, and anything outside of that is going to harm us and hurt us. See, Paul reframes the narrative in Corinth and he reframes the narrative in our world today away from what is expected, away from what's even desired, from personal fulfillment to leveraging your life to the glory of God. Here's my question for you that I want you to think about. What does it look like for you instead of trying to fit God into your life, what would it look like for you to conform your life into God's plan? Let me say it again. What does it look like for you, instead of trying to fit God into your life, for you to conform your life into God's plan? Really, the question is this. What is God calling you to do, and what needs to change to do it? Now, when you hear that, you probably hear what I hear. Change? I can't change. This is who I am. And in our own strength, we can't change. But God, by His grace can transform us into the image of his son. That everything he's called you to do, he will equip you to accomplish. What needs to change? 